Hi, this is Fish and welcome to Fish Picks. This is the first in a series of videos in which I'll be exploring the fundamentals of key impressioning. So let's get into it. I've been curious about impressioning locks for a while now, but have always shied away from it because I know how deep a rabbit hole it is. Finally, though, I've decided to take the leap with both feet and see if I can give it a go. Right from the start, I'd like to acknowledge the excellent guidance I've received from Martin Newton and Rubber Band, who have provided me with some of the basic tools, as well as advising me on how to get started. That having been said, any clumsiness or mistakes are entirely my own. If you're not already familiar with the concept of key impressioning, it's a non-destructive means of producing a working key without disassembling or picking a lock. Now, there are a number of different kinds of impressioning, including the use of foil, wax or clay. But for this series, we're going to be concerning ourselves with hard key impressioning. So this involves inserting a key blank into the target lock and then applying torque to induce a binding order. And then the key is moved up and down while still under tension, causing the key pins to leave marks against the polished edge of the key blank. These indicator marks are then filed away and the process is repeated until the correct bitting for the key is revealed and the open is achieved. This is, of course, easier said than done. In reality, this operation involves a great deal of skill and finesse, as I was soon to find out. So in this series, I'm going to be starting out by sharing with you the tools you'll need to impression a pin tumbler lock. And then I'll explain and demonstrate the methods used to prepare a key blank for impressioning. From there, we're going to take a look at the manipulation of the blank in the lock to secure the best indicator marks, how we should interpret those marks and the filing techniques you'll need to produce a working key. And then finally, we're going to put it all together and I'll share with you some of the tips and tricks that I've been using to progressively develop these skills. So let's begin by taking a look at the impressioning tools. I should like to point out at this stage that my approach is based upon the fact that I'm a lock sport hobbyist and not someone who needs to impression in the field or under covert circumstances. This means that I have the luxury of good lighting and I am afforded the space and time to work the lock in front of me. While I'll make passing reference to the differences in the tools and approaches demanded by field work, I have no experience in executing these skills at night, in the rain or in the freezing cold, in cramped conditions or in hostile circumstances, thank goodness. But kudos to those who have been there and done that. The first thing that we need to ensure when preparing to impression a lock is that we have a stable platform from which to work. We'll be applying quite strong forces to the cylinder and to the key, so a reliable vice or clamp is essential. After studying the rigs of various experienced practitioners, I settled on a system which is actually composed of photographic equipment produced by Manfrotto. Here I have two 035 super clamps, which can be secured together using one of two different kinds of joining studs. We have the 061, which connects the units in an aligned fashion, and the 061RA, which allows the clamps to be mounted at right angles to one another. The setup you choose will be dictated by the position of the surface that you'll be using relative to your seating position. So in my case, I'll be using the right angled stud and will then mount my cylinder in the upper clamp so that it faces me directly. This system is strong, lightweight, versatile, and portable, which is, I assume, why it's a favourite amongst those who take part in lock impressioning competitions. The other tool which needs to be able to endure applied forces is the impressioning handle, which will be used to hold the key blank in place. Now, I've seen some people using a set of locking pliers, which might be workable if you don't have the budget for a dedicated piece of equipment, but I'd strongly recommend investing in something more specialist when you can. I decided to pick up one of the handles made by Rubber Band, who runs Hooligan Keys, and this came along with an Allen wrench, some spare grub screws and a small round file, which I'll come to in a while. This is a really well-made piece of kit and ensures that I don't have to worry about slippage, 
The side gripping bar really ensures I can apply torque efficiently without undue fatigue. And so far I haven't broken a single key, which is something I understand happens quite often whilst learning to impression. And I'm sure that it's this tool that is at least in part responsible for reducing my wastage. So now let's talk about files. This is a subject of much debate and each practitioner will have their own recommendations but the consensus seems to be that a round Swiss number 4 file is the go-to tool for impressioning. It produces a very smooth finish with few or no aggressive tooling marks which is vital because you want to do everything you can to reduce the noise that might get in the way of reading the marks left by the pins. The two brands which have been recommended to me are Grobe and Velorb and I have no idea whether I'm pronouncing either of those names correctly, but both, I believe, are Swiss companies, and you can source them from locksport retailers or jewellery and culinary suppliers. This small Grobe round file is the one that came with my impressioning handle, and I like to use this one when first establishing my grooves on the key blank before transitioning to this wider file, but you could get away with just this wider one, I suspect. I also picked up a fine flat file which I use for preparing the key blank but you could substitute this for some fine grit sandpaper instead and in fact I use both interchangeably. So we'll look at how to use these files later on in this series but if you treat them well they should last you a lifetime. All of this filing results in fine metal powder which can get everywhere. You want to try and minimise the mess created, which can find its way into the lock mechanism, which isn't ideal. So I picked up a roll of draw liner from which I cut a mat on which I do all of my filing. And this can then be washed, wiped down and reused. I also keep a fine bristled toothbrush on hand to clean off the key blank between filing operations so that when I place it back into the lock, it's free from this same metal dust. So now let's look at optics. See what I did there? If you are lucky enough to have 2020 vision and decent lighting in the room where you work, you're probably good to go. I unfortunately do not. And so I've looked into a couple of different options to enhance my ability to see the fine marks left when impressioning. First, you could pick up a simple magnifying glass. This one's a jeweler's loop and comes with an LED black light and an LED light option and three magnifications of times 10, times 20 and times 30. And the obvious advantage of a tool like this is how compact and portable it is. And I've noticed that the black light in particular can really help pick up the impression points which appear either much darker or much lighter than they do to the naked eye. So this might be worth experimenting with. Alternatively, you could go with a head mounted magnification tool like this one. It comes with interchangeable lenses, the maximum magnification on this model being only times five, but that's certainly sufficient for impressioning. If you were to be working in the field, then you could instead invest in one of the scopes on the market, which provides contained and therefore covert lighting and magnification conditions. But these are really expensive and would only be worthwhile if you were a professional red teamer, or are independently wealthy, and I am neither, so I'll be sticking to the lower budget options. What I have invested in is an LED screen-mounted digital microscope, which magnifies up to 1200 times and has a 1080 high-definition stills and video recording facility. This is usually employed by those who need to do close work on circuit boards, for example, but it's ideal for capturing the details of impressioning marks as an instructional tool. So to be clear, I'm not suggesting you need one of these to practice impressioning, but I'm hoping that in future tutorials I'll be able to use this to supplement my usual video work so you can see exactly what's going on at each stage of the process. The last thing we need to talk about in terms of equipment is key blanks. My recommendation is that you should get far more than you think you're going to need. They're relatively inexpensive, but if you only have a few on hand, you'll be far more reticent about making mistakes. And you will make mistakes, plenty of them along the way, and that's to be expected when acquiring any new skill. Try to go for brass or some other soft alloy rather than steel key blanks. You want an easily marked metal to work with. Remember that most key pins are made from brass, and so if your blank is too hard, your marks will be harder to see if they're there at all. As for which locks and keys to work with, 
I'd suggest you go with brands that are readily available where you live. As someone based in the UK, I've started out by impressioning Yale keys because they're ubiquitous and relatively inexpensive, and Schlage because I have a number of Schlage cylinders in my collection and a large supply of blanks which I ordered on eBay a while back. I'd suggest you try to work on several locks because the impressioning process does take its toll on the key pins and springs, so you don't want to be impressioning the same lock again and again, or you're likely to damage them or at least blunt the pins to the point where the marks will be harder to read anyway. I'd also recommend you start by getting hold of locks for which you have working keys. This way you can have a template to compare against as you take your first steps. Working blind is okay, but if you fail to get an open, you might not know where you went wrong, and the focus to begin with should be on learning as efficiently as possible. To that end, it's also worth considering progressively pinning your first locks if possible. By starting with just two or three pins in place, you'll reduce the number of variables and get some early wins under your belt before advancing to five or six pin cores. As you may have noticed for this series, I'll be working predominantly with my Sparrow's cutaway lock because it's a useful training aid. It will allow us to see just what's going on inside the lock as I begin to file away the key blank. If you have something like this available, then do give this a try. There'll be plenty of time to work blind on more challenging locks once you have your fundamental skills dialed in. If you do get to the point where you're working with unknown locks without keys, it's critical that you begin by determining the number of pin stacks in play before selecting your blank. It's all too easy to assume, let's say you're working with five pins and miss the fact that you have a six pin core in front of you. By running a probe to the back of the core and applying pressure against the pins before slowly withdrawing the tool, you'll be able to feel each stack release so you know what you're working with. This can save a lot of frustration, but it also reassure you that you have a working mechanism. The last thing we'll be looking at today is how to prepare your key blanks ready for impressioning. If your key is going to break during the impressioning process, it's most likely to fracture at the shoulder because of the sharp angle at this point in the profile. The blank was not, of course, designed to be submitted to this kind of torsion and rough treatment, so it can be a good idea to file back this part of the blank. It takes just a few firm strokes of the round file and can save heartbreak down the line if your key snaps just as you are drawing close to the open. Most key blanks also have rough machining marks along the blade surface, and we want to remove as many of these as possible so the marks left by the key pins will be more easily notable. The simplest way to achieve this smoother surface is either with a fine flat file or with sandpaper as we've already discussed. If we compare this unprepared blank with the same key once I had polished the surface, you can see what a difference this simple process can make. Some impressioners will soot their blanks and this entails holding the blank over a candle flame so that the surface is coated with a fine layer of soot which will then be scratched away by the pins. Now, while I haven't sooted many of my blanks, I haven't found that the results when I have have been all that useful. Much of the soot seems to rub off as the key enters and exits the core, and the marks are, if anything, harder to make out because of the discoloration involved. Others look to achieve a similar effect by running a sharpie over the blade surface, and again, I've tried this, but the results have been equally underwhelming. Those of you who have dabbled in metalwork might also be aware of Prussian blue marking fluid, sometimes known as Dicom, which is a specialist dye which can help a machinist see the scratches and score marks on metal. Now, I have found this process does help the impressioning marks to stand out, but it's messy, takes a little time, and to be honest, the best results I've had are still produced by simply working with a polished blank. You can see here how much clearer the marks are than they were in the previous treatments. And finally, I should mention blading. If it's difficult to create clear marks, some practitioners file the blade of their key blank at a 45 degree angle on both sides so that the thinner edge is achieved. Then when the pins interact with this thinner material, it's more likely that they'll leave a clear indication. The challenge of this method, though, is that it's easy to take away too much material or to weaken the key in the process.
It's worth bearing in mind that whichever method of blank preparation you employ, the quality of the impressioning marks you transfer to your blank will be dictated to a large degree by the way in which you manipulate the key in the core. And that will be our starting point for part two of this series when we explore marking and filing techniques. But for now, I hope you found this week's episode useful. And until next time, take good care.